that was not there prior to the summer. Oh, the kids are home and they're bored. Absolutely. It's a beautiful piece of property, though. Hello, is uh, is Lisa on the call? Mm. Uh, I Lisa? don't know. Sometimes Betsy it says town of She's in the chat saying yeah. I am. Yes. Um, would, would it be at all possible if um, you can accept um, Councillor Heed as well as Kelly Moore and Tamara Lanier? Andre, you're muted. Yes, uh, th thank you, Councillor Heed. And uh, is Nananaya here? Um, she is not here, um, so we will, um, um, I'm just reading a note. Yes, we will uh, assume she is running late. Um, therefore, um, I will call this uh, Public Safety Committee meeting to order at 5.02. Uh, councilors present are Councilor Bordelon, Councilor Heed, and myself, uh, Councilor Bumgardner. Um, approval of the meeting minutes. Um, I um, just sent for our uh, our committee um, wrapping up um, writing those meeting minutes. Um, you know, wanted to uh, include commentary specifically made by uh, our town attorney, and uh, just wanted to do the due diligence. Uh, getting as much information as possible. Um, you know, as you know, many, many uh, committees meet uh, monthly. Um, we have so far met uh, bi-monthly. So, um, you know, usually a month, um, a month, uh, as, you know, a, a month break um, allows enough time to, um, you know, to uh, uh, prepare uh, meeting minutes ahead of time. So I apologize to my committee for that. Um, we will then approve those meeting minutes as well as uh, these meeting minutes for today at our next public safety committee. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, move on to uh, new business. Um, we are um, very privileged to be graced uh, with the presence of um, uh, two uh, uh, outstanding uh, individuals who uh, have given back to their respective communities and um, in uh, civic causes. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, Tamara specifically. Um, um, she needs no introduction. Um, you know, though uh, I've had the privilege again of, of, of working with her in uh, several different, wearing several different hats and capacities over the years. Um, she has uh, been an outspoken uh, proponent of, um, of you know, police accountability and um, progressive po uh, policing policy reform um, and um, has been in the fight um, in, in, uh, at the local and, and state level. Um, and has a, a significant amount of um, background knowledge uh, that I think will be helpful to the discussion. Um, and most importantly, serves as uh, the New London NAACP um, uh, 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 chapter vice president. Um, so we are very fortunate and lucky to have her as well as um, I believe some other folks from the NAACP that uh, may be joining us. Um, also joining us is uh, Kelly Moore, who serves as the a policy council for the uh, ACLU of CT. Uh, as many know, the ACLU played a critical role in passing um, uh, the police accountability uh, bill at the state legislature, um, working with a committee leadership on um, on uh, language uh, as they're drafting that that that, um, that bill. So uh, we are very appreciative of, of Kelly's presence. Um, um, I do see um, Ms. Hodge in a, in attendance. Um, uh, and so we welcome um, Ms. Hodge, who is a, um, a, a high school teacher at Fitch High School and um, serves as the faculty advisor to the Groton Youth Collective. Um, uh, Ms. A we are waiting for Ms. Ali um, uh, to join us. Um, so we will, um, I, I'd be happy to pass it off to um, uh, any of you um, in any particular order. I know um, we, we had uh, Ms. Ali to uh, speak first. So um, in lieu of Miss um, Ali, um, I, I hope she does join us, but 
Um, Ms. Hodge, would you just like to say anything about the Groton Youth Collective um, so uh, uh, the public um, learns about the organization and the, their work um, over uh, the past few months? Well, um, it's, it's a rambunctious group. Um, they just have a lot on their plate. As a matter of fact, we're meeting with a few of them this evening because we're preparing for a um, Groton Public School teacher workshop next Friday. Um, so they're all over the place, whether they're um, preparing um, uh, activities across um, Connecticut or the region and in our schools. Um, they, they, they're just doing a lot. I, I, it's, it's hard to keep up with them. But last week they attended the Ledger um, and Preston and Groton joint protest. Um, they met the, a couple weeks before that, they met with uh, Groton uh, Police Department, um, uh, Officer Fasario, Sawyer, Bousquet, McClellan, um, our local mayors and town manager was there. Um, so they, they're trying to make change in Groton. So um, I haven't talked to Miss Ali today. I talked to her last night, um, but I'm hoping she makes it as well. Thank, thank you, Ms. Hodge. And um, I, um, I'll, I, I did read um, earlier the, um, the petition that was circulated by the Groton Youth Collective. Um, it was an online petition um, seeking demands at the local and, and state level uh, in terms of police accountability and racial injustice. And, um, you know, I was um, going to kind of get into some of that material as well, because I think that's very important, especially, again, some of their demands surrounding police accountability and measures and reforms they would like to see um, in um, here in Groton. So um, uh, I will now pass it off to uh, um, Ms. Lanier for kind of her opening uh, statement and um, you know, followed by um, uh, Ms. Um, Ms. Moore. Hey, thank you, Andre. My name is Tamara Lanier. I am a retired chief probation officer after 27 years of service with the Connecticut, uh, State of Connecticut Judicial Branch. I'm also recently retired from the State Conference of NAACP branches. I was the criminal justice chair my responsibility there was to actually travel the state and work with other branches on criminal justice issues, on policing issues, on um, anything related to um, criminal justice, including um, the Department of Corrections, um, local police, state police, um, and, and also the federal government. And I am currently the vice president of the local branch of the NAACP. Uh, I attend St. John's Christian Church in Groton. Uh, and I am also a member on the board of the ACLU. Um, I have a long history, a long dedicated history of fighting for um, social justice, um, equity and fairness and um, I have also uh, been a, a proponent for many years of the civilian review boards uh, that uh, every police department in the state should have a civilian review board. Uh, civilians or residents of the community should have a voice in the community policing and how their police department engages with its, uh, its residents. And there should be a dialogue um, and there should be ongoing community building between police and community. And um, it's interesting in traveling the states and working with different branches in their efforts with the police department, it is really apparent when you're in a community and there is not a healthy police community relationship. Um, it is, um, when I say really apparent, uh, you, you see immediately uh, the, the distrust, uh, the, the lack of respect, um, the, the, the unwillingness to, to um, empathize with other parties or other partners. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm glad that this conversation is happening in Groton. It's certainly something that I have been a proponent of. And I think, again, the um, 
to, to engage police in the community in a healthy relationship. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the way we should be operating locally. And um, I only see benefit um, to, to giving civilians a say in how their police departments are governed. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Ms. Lanier. And before I pass it off to Ms. Moore, um, just as a formality, I would like to recognize um, Representative Thomas, uh, the chair of the, um, I'm going to butcher it, but the, uh, the oversight uh, committee, I, I know they're doing work, um, you know, uh, around police accountability issues and looking, you know, to, in studying the um, establishment of a CP, civilian re, a police review board. So um, with that, I will pass it over to Representative Thomas so he can um, uh, quick also recognize um, uh, the uh, distinguished members of the RTM who uh, serve on that committee as well. Uh, thank you, Council Um Can you guys hear me all right? I can't. Uh, hello. Uh, Re Representative Thomas, would um, would you like me to um, uh, recognize Ms. Moore uh, and then um, have you uh, uh, open up uh, the meeting? I just want to make sure that the uh, RTM has started uh, the uh, their portion of the meeting as it, as it is a joint meeting. Yes, I was trying to speak. I, I don't know. I'm, I have Zoom on my phone, so I'm not sure if it's coming through correctly. Can you hear me? Yes, and, and I just oh, okay. uh, the administrative duty. So um, in terms of being allowed to, you know, recognizing you to speak and, and whatnot, you're, you are free to, to, to go. Okay, great. Uh, well, I, I thank you for inviting us in for this joint session. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mobile right now. I'm trying to get myself back home so I can get onto a laptop. So um, I'm going to just kind of pass and say thank you very much for having us. I look forward to the conversation. I'm, I'm excited to hear from all the speakers you have lined up and I'm glad to be part of the process. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Thomas. And uh, with that, I will recognize Ms. Moore for her um, opening remarks. Thank you. Um, I want to start out by saying that uh, my remarks are a little bit lengthy uh, just because I'm uh, trying to be really thorough with you all. Um, if I am impeding on your time, please feel free to let me know. Um, so with that said, good evening. I'm Kelly Moore, um, and as Councillor Blumgarner mentioned, I'm the Policy Council for the ACLU of Connecticut. Uh, while I do not live in Groton, I'm a Hartford resident. I'm here tonight to talk about civilian review boards generally, um, the civilian review board provisions in Public Act 20-1, which is the police accountability bill from this summer, and uh, to address some concerns about the powers of CRBs and how they would work in the town of Groton. Thank you so much for the opportunity to do so. Um, so as an initial matter, a civilian review board is just one important mechanism to ensure that a town's police department really serves its people. Um, and it's critical to remember that no one policy is the solution to making our communities safer and healthier. Um, but as one component of a robust policy of police police accountability platform, civilian review boards can be extremely powerful. On the other hand, many towns have tried civilian review boards and have been disappointed when they don't see the changes that they've envisioned. The difference between these two outcomes is the vast range of authority and resources that can be given to a CRB. Um, and CRBs that are effective typically have a few things in common. First, they have members who are mostly community members and few to no members who are beholden to police interests. This ensures independence and consideration of the needs and concerns of the community the police are meant to be serving. Um, the second thing is the ability to make filing police complaints easy and broad authority to review those complaints. Um, the third important component is that a CRB has the tools to conduct effective complaint review, which include investigatory authority and subpoena power. Without these, it's far too easy for uh, oversight efforts to be stymied and ineffective. Um, and then a fifth, I'm sorry, a fourth element would be the ability to look not just at individual complaints, but trends and patterns uh, with policing to see if there are overall big picture needs to be corrected. Uh, 
and the final two components, secure funding and sufficient due process protections. All of these are incredibly important. So when the General Assembly passed Public Act 20-1, uh, it made it easier for municipalities to create robust CRBs. Specifically, the legislature has allowed towns to vest their civilian review boards with subpoena power and to permit CRBs to perform investigations. Uh, with these authorizations, there's nothing preventing the town of Brooklyn from establishing a meaningful CRB, except possibly political will. I want to acknowledge that it may not be possible to create a CRB today that has every possible power and authority, but that's okay. The best CRBs across the U.S. reflect a constant process of improvement by municipalities. Um, it's still important to start by creating an independent CRB that can begin the process of bringing both transparency to police discipline and more democracy to what has typically been a closed system of policing. Um, I understand that a few concerns about how a CRB would work in the town of Groton with respect to the town charter, so I just wanted to address those. Um, first, I believe, um, I believe that between the town charter and the police accountability bill, the town council could pretty clearly grant subpoena power to a CRB. The town charter already explicitly grants the town council the power to investigate the departments and agencies of the town and to issue subpoenas for witnesses and documents as part of those investigations. That's section 5.6. With this existing power, the town council already has the power to investigate the police department and issue subpoenas supporting such investigations. Um, these could be delegated to a CRB or at a minimum, a CRB could request the town council to issue such subpoenas for it. Um, this existing power works really well with the police accountability bill. The entire legislative purpose of that section of the bill was to grant municipalities the ability to confer subpoena powers on CRBs. Um, since CRBs, by their very nature, investigate police, any interpretation of the statute, uh, I'm sorry, of the section of the police accountability bill that prevents CRBs from subpoenaing the police would really frustrate the entire purpose of that section and render it futile and meaningless. Uh, such a reading of the police accountability bill could not be correct. Furthermore, as this committee probably knows, the General Assembly has granted subpoena power to municipal bodies in the past, like, for example, ethics boards. Um, I've reviewed the case law and have been unable to find cases that raised or found that ethics boards, which subpoenaed municipal, municipal employees, created a separation of powers concern. In short, it appears to me that the town council already has subpoena powers that would cover investigations of the police department, and if it does not, the new police account accountability bill would confer such authority um, so that the town council could grant subpoena power to a CRB. Uh, I don't see any reason why the town of Groton could not create a CRB with subpoena power right now. I understand that the second issue concerns investigatory authority of a CRB. Um, first, I just wanna be clear that most CRBs in Connecticut and across the country on, uh, in, on purpose have concurrent jurisdiction with police departments to conduct investigations. So rather than take away investigatory power from the police, CRBs typically run in a parallel process to the police when they are investigating complaints. This is actually a really important function because it allows the people being served by the police department to see areas where there's a mismatch, right? Where the internal process doesn't live up to what an independent external body says should be happening. With this in mind, it's pretty clear that um, the CRB could conduct investigations in the town of Groton. It's certainly true that the police department already has a process for handling complaints that was adopted in accordance with state law. Um, the town police department's policy is based on a statewide model complaint policy. Um, but this policy does not claim to be an exclusive. And instead, it actually explicitly says that the police department has primary authority for conducting investigations. This language indicates to me that others could have additional authority by the very nature of the policy. I also want to note that the same policy is used across towns in Connecticut and to date anyways I'm not aware of successful challenges to CRB investigatory authority based on that policy. Um, I think there's two other concerns. I will try to get through them quickly. I know I'm uh, <laughs> impeding on your uh, hospitality. Um, I understand that there are some concerns about whether a CRB can be structured to supervise the police chief, police employees, or to direct police department operations. Um, let me allay that concern a little bit because generally I'm not aware that CRBs purport to supervise police employees or direct operations of a police department. In general, that's not the functions that they serve. 
Um, it seems like the underlying concern here might be whether a CRV can directly discipline police officers, but again, most CRVs don't claim to have the authority to do so, even highly effective ones. Rather, CRVs for the most part issue guidance, so that can write, and it can have a range of how binding it is. I want to be clear that the inability of CRVs to direct discipline has actually been one of the main stumbling blocks to having effective civilian review boards. So that means that a good solution must both acknowledge that the final responsibility for discipline does rest with the police chief, but um, a good policy will also take steps to make CRB recommendations carry some real weight. Uh, one potential way to do this is the way they do it in Newark, New Jersey. There, the CRB, the police chief, and representatives of the uh, collective bargaining units from the police department were required to get together and create a disciplinary matrix. So this matrix listed out all the kinds of misconduct that could occur and the penalties for them. It also said, oh, you know, if you have these factors, we should actually probably scale our discipline down a little bit. And if you have these factors, we probably need to amp up the discipline a little bit. So the discipline calculated under the matrix is then the presumptive discipline to be given if misconduct is found. The direct involvement of the police chief and police unions negated any problems with the CRB's authority to issue discipline. Another way to address this is a model where discipline suggested by the CRB is where you start from. The police chief retains final authority and can implement different discipline, um, but uh, places that have made this model effective are those where CRBs can require police chiefs who deviate from the discipline recommendations to either provide written explanations or come before a public hearing of the CRB. So there are ways to address uh, this issue that still create a robust CRV. I think either of those solutions or other ones could be adopted in the town of Groton without any problems with the town charter. They're not perfect models, but they are ways to get more transparency and accountability than exists now. Uh, and one final concern that I believe was raised is whether a CRV can adopt policies regarding policing. Uh, this is a problem I think is unlikely to arise. I'm not aware of CRBs that have the ability to adopt on their own binding policies or ordinances. Uh, they may exist, but I'm not aware of them and they are not common or so. Um, rather, most CRBs simply recommend policy changes. And so I think that a CRB with the power to make policy recommendations could be created immediately in the town of Groton. And I actually think that the town uh, attorneys agreed on that point. So in short, from my viewpoint, there may be barriers to creating a CRB in the town of Groton that has every imaginable power over policing, but there's no barrier that I see to creating a robust CRB with straightforward investigative and subpoena power that has the ability to look into both individual complaints and patterns within policing. I will wrap it up there. Thank you so much for your uh, leniency and uh, patience. Uh, th thank you, Ms. Moore. And before I pass it off to um, other counselors and um, uh, RTM members for questions, I, I'd just like to ask a, a yes or no question to Ms. Moore. Um, so it, it, again, it, it is of your belief that it is within um, the law uh, that, um, that the town of Groton may establish uh, a police accountability review board with subpoena power uh, without, without violating the town charter. Is that correct? I want to be careful because I don't want to be here in sort of a representative capacity advising you, but yes, that's my belief. All right. Thank, thank you. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to um, Representative Thomas uh, if he is ready for uh, any questions or um, and, and or, and or um, that way he can also um, recognize uh, RTM members who have questions. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you, Council Baumgartner. And I apologize, I did not um, introduce my, uh, the um, other representatives earlier. I was in the middle of driving, so I didn't have full concentration on what we're discussing. Um, so, um, Representative Cassieri and Representative Dean Shinbrock and Representative Hanscom are in attendance from the uh, Civilian Oversight Review uh, Research Committee. Um, do any of you have questions you want to start off with? I believe uh, Representative Cassieri has her hand raised. Representative Cassieri. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Ms. Moore. 
Um, in your opinion, based on your findings, um, would the subpoena power, would that compel officers to actually speak? Um, or would that just consist of them having to attend? That's a great question. And I don't actually know that I have a final answer um, because I have not in preparation for this reviewed um, the collective bargaining agreement that exists. So that is going to be a factor there. Um, I would say that um, without further research, my, um, my inclination would be that it could compel attendance, but not necessarily the actual testimony. I'm happy to look into that a little further to get a clearer answer. Is it fair to say that most police union, unions would block their officers from testifying? I think that would generally be the position, yes. Um, one of the one of the things that uh, needs to be considered is um, making subpoena power enforceable. Uh, the statute does not do that. It would be up to the town council to create enforcement mechanisms on that. Um, so without such, it's also hard to see any reason why, uh, why people would not refuse to testify if there are no potential downsides to saying silence. I just have one more question, if that's okay, Councillor. Yes, uh, please proceed, Representative. Thank you. Um, would one of the courses of action of the officers not um, actually being compelled to speak, would that mean that the town would have to take them to court for a judge to compel to them to speak? That is the way that some subpoena, municipal subpoena powers are enforced, and that is a potential course of action that uh, could be written into uh, an ordinance creating the CRB. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Lanier or Ms. Hodge, uh, do you have any comment on, on uh, any of those questions? Well, I, I as I'm listening, I was thinking, um, and wondering, have you engaged your town council, your town attorney in these discussions? Because again, I see variances across the state. I know not necessarily with a civilian review board, but with an ethics board that I was a part of that discussion. The town did go to court, did get a subpoena and the language in the subpoena um, was specific in that what it is asking for that is what the officer has to comply with or the responding, the receiving person. So it's kind of hard to speak in general generalities about specifically what a subpoena can and can't do without the framework behind it. So I think a good person to have on these discussion or in these discussions is your town attorney to pose these questions to them. And I also think, and you know, and listening and not really, and I apologize, familiar with all of the history and the backstory is whether or not you actually need a civilian review board with subpoena power. What is your relationship with the police and the community at this point? Is it necessary? Um, and, and I can say to you in, in, in communities that I've worked with civilian review boards, I don't recall one that had subpoena power. Um, so the question is whether or not to begin, is that necessary? And, and, and what would you like your review board to have oversight of? Is it complaints against police departments is a, a specific officer? Is it um, um, procedurally administrative issues? So um, I, I, I think one of the things that I would suggest is to sit down and kind of frame how you would like to see your civilian reboard, review board function. But the ultimate goal is to have a better police community relationship. So you want your board to work in concert with the police as opposed to be, and, and, and in, that, in that collaborative, there can still be oversight. Um, sometimes the best of partnerships are when you challenge and you are critical of the people you're working with. Um, 
So, uh, you know, again, I, I, without knowing the history and, and the work that you've done thus far, the question is what type of review board does the town of Groton need? What type of authority would you, would, uh, would you give that board? And um, whether or not subpoena powers are necessary, not to say at some point later, when you feel like in, 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 in one local community that I'm working with, the review board feels that, um, they, they, that they don't really have the authority they need to be effective. So that town has to go back to the drawing board and look at those responsibilities and, and make an assessment as to whether or not you need to enlarge the responsibilities of those review boards. Um, so it's, it's, it's a work in progress, um, but I think um, what uh, I, I, I'm not certain of is what is your vision for your review board? Can I just add also, I wanna uh, bring up something that Ms. Lanier already brought up, that if we can have, I don't know, uh, an attorney present or list of questions and then go to attorney to contact and, and see if what, the committee can do and cannot do and address it that way. So there won't be any question, no speculation, and that not all our questions will be answered. A absolutely. And just, um, you know, for folks who um, did not attend the or, or watch the last public safety committee meeting, um, our first inaugural uh, public safety committee, um, we, um, we invited Eileen Duggan, who serves as our uh, town attorney to review uh, the um, uh, the series of questions compiled by counselors on um, the establishment of the police accountability review, I'm sorry, the police civilian, uh, civ civilian police review board. Um, and uh, among, you know, uh, as well as an, a more general review of the police accountability bill passed by the state legislature. Um, and, and I thought that was very informative. There is a, um, for, you know, for folks who haven't watched the um, that video, you can go to the Groton Municipal Television um, YouTube channel where they have uh, that meeting um, posted. So um, for RTM members as well as you're doing your research and, um, and I know many counselors have, have um, um, you know, utilized that video to, um, you know, to prepare for today as well. So um, with that, I, I see uh, Councilor Bordelon uh, has uh, questions. Thank you. Yes, I, I just agree with what was already stated. Um, I guess the question is, where do we go? Um, and we did have the attorney at the last meeting. It was informative, informative, but there were some gray areas that still I feel I was left with. With uh, it was addressed, but it was like addressed in a way where it, it to me was inconclusive. Inconclusive. Looking at section five point six, um, you know. It kind of reminds me of some types of things some people will say bi biblically, you know, it depends on how you interpret what version you bring to the table. What religion you're bringing to the table right there's so many interpretations of the rules and the laws and that even and to the point where people have used the Bible to make racial um, judgments on folks of color. So when we look at things interpretation and I look at this charter that was written. There's no appendix where you can look at line on 5.6 and then go there for more detail on, you know, what they meant by under that section. So I'm still left with, would it be possible that, and it's nothing with any disrespect to our current attorney, but my question is, should we bring out an, an outside attorney? Because when you have one person review it, the interpretation can be kind of different um, depending on what lens of, uh, of scope of practice or your background that you bring to the table when you look at this. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to be clear about. Is there room in this wording that it depends on how, how and who's reading it under um, you know, what, what the intention or the, or the thought process is? Um, I had addressed a few questions and you know, it was kind of, you know, back and forth and some things were answered pretty clearly. Um, you know, it says, you know, in our charter that the council is the direct boss to our town manager, but also the town manager oversees our police chief. And so my question too was like, you know, should we, is it, is it appropriate to have in a town and, and maybe somebody could answer that has more experience with this than I do, um, is that the practice where our town manager oversees the police chief? What if the complaints about the police chief? 
not saying that we had any complaints about our police chief for full disclosure, not saying that I'm thinking there should be complaints about our police chief or that I think there's anything wrong with our police chief. I just want to clear that for the record. This is not a personal attack against anybody or our police chief. I'm just using it as an example of our structure of government in our town. So looking at that, is that I mean, I'm just looking at my own job, right? Like if we have a problem with my boss, we have somebody else in a different state that doesn't work directly um, on a day-to-day -day basis in the town that's in charge of the hiring and firing. So some could say, or some have addressed me and said that could be a conflict of interest. Should there be another way to make sure that not for just the police chief that we currently have, but for future police chiefs, future town managers, that we're having that transparency and accountability and having all the checkpoints that actually reflect what we wanna bring out of this charter and what we wanna see on our review board. So I'm not sure, I just said a whole bunch of things that I'm not sure what I'm um, really saying here, but looking at that, those are things that I had questions maybe to address to um, the representative here from the NAACP and the ACLU um, as to what are your thoughts on, on, on how ethically that is um, you know, currently part um, and existing of how our current structure works and when looking at how we review this for later. Thanks. Well, go ahead, Ms. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Counselor. I think those concerns are really, really valid. Um, this is an area where there can be disagreement among reasonable minds about what the town charter says, and that's sort of the entire problem, right? Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, the town council's job is to take under advisement the advice it gets from all corners, including its town attorneys, potentially outside attorneys, um, and make its, its best judgment. And so in areas where it's inconclusive, um, I, I think there is room for discretion to act. I will also say that the, the uh, police accountability bill from this summer, when read in conjunction with some pieces of the town charter, I think do does operate to clarify things. It operates, for me at least, to clarify the subpoena piece of it. Um, but I think, um, I think your concerns are really well founded that, uh, that it can be read different ways. My reading of, of the provisions of the town charter uh, would, uh, seems to indicate to me that both investigatory power and subpoena power would not be in conflict with the town charter. Um, obviously though, there's room for disagreement. The town attorneys disagreed on that point. Um, when I made that, assessment, I looked at both the language of the recent police accountability bill, the language of the town charter, um, cases in similar situations like ethics boards, that sort of thing, um, and looked to all of those factors to reach that conclusion. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. I also, um, I wanted to address something Ms. Linear said, which I think was very well raised earlier, which is that uh, up until this summer, uh, police accountability, I'm sorry, civilian review boards in Connecticut were operating without subpoena power, and some of them were operating very effectively. Um, I'd say the model or the majority type across, Connect, uh, across the entire country is a review model that doesn't have independent investigatory authority. There's certainly room to do something like that now and expand when you have clarity. Um, I my opinion is that it's not necessary to go that narrow, but that is certainly an option. And um, I think that it's, it's a really good point that Ms. Lanier raised that um, starting narrow and starting small is not um, starting bad. It's, um, it's definitely a, a move towards democratizing the process, which is always a good thing. And um, changes down the road are possible. We see them all the time in this area and um, it, it can be helpful in that it reflects the actual experience of what a uh, civilian review board is actually encountering in the valley. And I just wanted to add that um, 
And again, I apologize for not being more informed about the structure of Groton Town's government, but I will say this, uh, your job is to govern. That's what you were elected to do. And so you um, will certainly get a variation of opinions, but ultimately the decision rests on your shoulders because you were elected to govern in the best interest of your constituents, the people who put you in office. Now with the passage of this legislation and the mandate, um, the resistance can be there, but you now have a new charge. You must form a civilian review board. And so um, I think if your charter is not in line with this legislation, then we have a problem with your charter. Or, and, and, and many many communities may find themselves in this predicament now, but the key is what are we gonna do about it or what are you going to do about it? If there is a gray area um, that does not specifically say you can't, then to me, that opens the door to say you can, because if the intention was that this not be done, it would be expressly stated. So I think where the gray area by default benefit those elected officials who are looking for reformative measures. Um, as far as I'm a little concerned, if I'm hearing that there is no real oversight of your police chief, and um, I know your police chief well, he's a wonderful person, and this is no criticism of him, but no one in the real world or should ever be in a position where you're working with little to no oversight. This is the problem we have in policing today because it is an entity that has virtually functioned without oversight and accountability for years and has been granted more and more authority every year and no oversight. So if, if the way your department is structured where there is no direct, there's no review, there's no performance review, there's no feedback, there's no, for no, no oversight that's coming back to the governing body, um, I would say that that would be problematic and I would do whatever I could in my power to, to remedy that. And and it's not to say, because trust me, <laughs> the NAACP does get complaints about police chiefs. I've been personally involved in different communities with three complaints about police chiefs. Um, and, and so it does happen. So fortunately, you are in a predicament where that has never happened in Groton, and thank God for that. But that's not to say it won't. You need a system in place where you can step in and do your due diligence in accordance to your government or your policies that allows you to have that kind of oversight. So um, I, 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 I would only say this, that if there is not a mechanism in place, uh, uh, I would strongly encourage you to move in that direction as quickly as you can. Thank you, thank you for all the um, comments. And like I said, for full clarification, my understanding is that the town manager oversees our police chief and that is our structure um, and it kind of stops there um, and then the decisions made um, you know we you know as to where that goes from um, at the point in which so but I thank you for your clarif clarifying points and um, I look forward to reaching out to you guys and maybe learning some more stuff. Share a personal story why that is just simply not enough and it involves my daughter whose complaint it was about a police chief. Um, my daughter was in a, at a parking lot of a uh, mall, legally parked, texting on her phone. And the chief walked by and saw her and thought she was suspicious and then called in the squad who were patrolling the, um, the parking lot and turned out to be like 10 police officers who virtually terrorized her for like five minutes. But at any rate, she made a complaint and we actually sat down with the first selectman and no one saw the harm in the unlawful seizure of my daughter, the, um, the, the um, uh, obstructing of her free will and the terrorizing and the abuse of her for that time. 
was a violation of her Fourth Amendment rights and different things. So the trouble I have with just that one person uh, who probably the police chief has a working relationship with is there still needs to be checks and balances to ensure that there is oversight and accountability. So something needs to come to the body as a group to say, okay, town selectman or okay, city manager or okay, um, whatever the, the capacity may be. We have confidence in your ability to oversee the chief. Those things have to be reported back to you or otherwise you have a relationship between the police and the, the chief and the selectman where there may be no accountability and nobody knows. And something to think about. I, sorry, if I may, um, you have to work with the structure of government that you have, but that does not mean that there are no solutions. So some solutions that I have seen to situations like that um, are, for example, CRBs that um, do performance evaluations of the police chief based on things within their discretion. They do not have hiring or firing or disciplinary authority, but they bring the information to light. They get it out both to the town manager, the whatever executive in that structure, um, and to the public so that there's a method of democratization and openness. So even if there is not a mechanism for, like I said, direct removal, direct termination, um, direct discipline, there are ways to make it open and accountable. Um, so that's just one potential. Of it, so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Bordelon. And, and with that, I will uh, recognize uh, Representative Thomas, um, who I I believe uh, we'll recognize uh, Representative Hanscom. I'm oh, sorry, I meant to put my hand down. <laughs> Representative uh, Hanscom, do you have a question? No, actually, I I was uh, listening to um, some of the, fo the things folks were saying, and I, I know I sound like a broken record a bit, but I think one of the things we really have to like start thinking about first is like, what do we really want to accomplish? Like, why are we creating this? What's the purpose? You know, it's kind of those broader questions and then get down into the nitty gritty. Personally, I don't feel like there needs to be any kind of um, subpoena power at this point. I mean, the whole, if the goal is to bridge the community with the police, then, you know, um, it's not this out, it's not like who has power over the other. I think it, they can work together. And it, I mean, I would imagine that would be the main, you know, focus of the, a committee such as that. Uh, so, th yeah, so I just feel like we need to figure out what do we want to accomplish and then go look at what, you know, um, what the possibilities are. Thank you, Representative. And um, I'll pass it off to Councillor Heap. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Baumgartner. Um, so actually, a uh, couple of things that I was interested in have already been uh, answered, um, particularly from uh, summed up well by Representative Hanscom. Uh, but two things uh, I thought were interesting. Uh, Ms. Lanier uh, stated, uh, we need to start with what we want to do. Um, and uh, I think, you know, if I just answer that question simply, I'm not sure what I want to do. What I know I want to do is have a process where if somebody has a complaint, it doesn't just get lost in some bureaucratic uh, room in the back office and nobody ever hears about it. I want something that's public. I want a standing committee, I don't know, five to seven citizens on it. Um, but I'm not sure what else would need to be on it. And I thought that uh, Ms. Moore uh, made some very good points, um, including, uh, you know, we could charge them with um, doing uh, performance reviews. Uh, but she also said something that I thought was kind of interesting, and I wanted to ask a little bit more on this. Uh, that is, if uh, the chief were to make a decision on something, and um, I, I don't remember exactly what you said about that, so I'd like you to, to rephrase it or maybe provide an example or something. And is that something that you think we would um, be advised to have uh, right off the bat in the, the first uh, version of this? Thank you. 
Thank you, Counselor. Um, so uh, what I was speaking about, about um, the police having, the police chief having the final say over discipline is very much sort of the same point that Counselor Bordelon was making about the structure um, and the separation of powers, right? So um, there are separation of powers issues if we remove the ability of the chief to, and by extension, the executive branch to have the power to control the operations, including discipline within the police department. So that's like sort of the overarching concern. Um, and so when you look at this and say, this is a structural problem that maybe we can't change, then the question is, what solutions exist where we don't have to make radical structural changes, but where there are still opportunities for meaningful oversight and accountability? Um, so there's a variety of ways to get at it. The one I talked about uh, is the concept of a disciplinary matrix. So this is a agreed upon set of discipline guidelines. Um, so this is agreed upon between the CRB the police chief and union representatives. Um, and they go out in advance and say, here are the categories of misconduct that can occur. Within those categories, um, we have a range of severity of that misconduct. When we look at each offense and the things that make it more or less severe, here are the range of potential sanctions for that. Uh, and so that's agreed in advance, right? It's not applied to any particular case. It's sort of a set of guidelines that exists uh, cleanly in the ether. Uh, and so then once the CRB starts operating, starts looking at complaints, starts reviewing possibly things that uh, the police department has done internally, it can say, um, we've looked at this matrix and based on what we found to be the misconduct in this case, based on the evidence, the right level of discipline is here, or possibly a range. And they pass that along to the chief of police, right? They don't have the power to tell the chief of police, go impose that. They tell the police, this is our recommendation. Police chief, this is our recommendation. Um, the police chief then has final authority to issue the discipline. But what has worked well in a lot of communities is if you start from a place that those recommendations are presumptively correct, right? So if you start from there, uh, they're presumptively correct, but the police chief retains final authority. Um, some ways to make sure that the police chief isn't deviating from those agreed upon things uh, constantly is to then require the police chief to answer for it. So that answering could be, he could make a written report. He could have to appear before the CRB, he could have to appear before the town council and explain why the deviation occurred in that place. Uh, so that is, that's just actually one potential policy solution. Another solution would be to get rid of the matrix altogether and just do the second piece, right? So the CRB makes a recommendation. They say that a two week suspension is the correct uh, discipline in, any, in a particular case. And if the police chief deviates from that, the police chief has to be answerable to that. So those are just ways to sort of conceptualize how we work with an existing framework where the police chief retains final control over discipline, but doesn't, uh, isn't unanswerable for those decisions. I hope did that, I hope that cleared that up a little bit. Yes, that helps. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Councillor Heed. Uh, before I, I pass it off to uh, Representative Thomas, um, uh, just do have a, a few questions and comments, um, you know, you know, most first and foremost, I want to thank um, our amazing um, panelists um, who, uh, who have you know come out tonight to um, you know share their thoughts and um, uh, their research with us. So uh, again, it is much appreciated. Um, my question is about um, if we were to establish a police civilian um, review board, um, and we consider whom we would want to appoint specifically to that body. Um, you know, I, I, I personally believe the emphasis should be on civilian, um, you know, um, that the, that body is composed of um, individuals who uh, live in our community, um, 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 uh, individuals who identify as um, uh, black or uh, Latino um, or of the uh, LGBTQ 
um, um, in uh, or uh, other um, marginalized groups in in um, our community and in America. Um, and I, I think that representation is important. Um, you know, someone from uh, the disabilities uh, community. Um, so, you know, my question to you um, or, you know, to, to our uh, panelists is um, how should that body, how, sh um, how what, what should the make, the makeup of that body uh, look like? Um, and um, how should we also, uh, should that body be an appointed body um, or, um, or, you know, and or how should um, the, the, our uh, council go about um, choosing who would ultimately serve on this uh, police accountability review board? Well, I think it's a very important process and um, certainly um, the inclusiveness of it is, is key to the success of the board. Um, me personally, I believe that there should be a number of people who have law enforcement or police history to be a part of that committee. I believe that certain stakeholders in your community should have a voice on that committee. And I believe that um, it should be somewhat of an interview process where people um, are, are asked to virtually um, um, sell themselves as to why they would be the best candidate to sit in, in that important role. Um, so it's an interview process, but I would also encourage you to look at the Department of Justice's website and to also visit the website of other neighboring communities who have also gone, who've already gone through this process and how they framed their review boards and what steps they took. Um, I know that I have, in, in working with other groups, have done just that, looked at other police review boards, but the town of Groton is unique. And what works in Groton may not work in Hartford or what works in Groton may not work in New London. So you want to look at a variation of different types of review boards to see what you think works best in your community. But ultimately, um, you want interested parties, people who are committed because, um, you know, this work is not for the faint of heart. It's not easy sitting and hearing um, complaints from people who are, are, are either traumatized or emotionally upset. Um, and also in dealing with police departments, police unions um, is also a very difficult um, experience in that, again, you're dealing with people who are used to having absolute authority and not having that question. So whoever sits in those seats and shares those spaces, it's, it's a huge commitment. And, and they're gonna have to be willing up front to sign on and say, yes, I'm willing to do this. And yes, I understand X, Y, and Z. And I'm committed to filling this expectation or fulfilling this expectation. So it's an interview process uh, where you certainly want stakeholders in your community. You want representatives of your community. That board should reflect the town of Groton and um, it should have law enforcement, it should have attorneys, it should have, you know, again, you, it should have, um, um, I don't know if you have chaplains in your police department, but it should have a religious component, it should have a religious representative. And so, um, sorry, um, but you um, would have to sit down and, and identify who your stakeholders are to solicit their interest. Um, but then again, it's a commitment and it's a responsibility and it's not an easy job. So you have to have someone who's gonna be committed to the cause. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lanier. Uh, uh, Ms. Moore, do, um, would you like to uh, answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as a general matter, I do agree with what Ms. Lanier said. It is a um, very local decision, right? So um, in CRVs generally, um, it, there's less of a uh, one size fits all approach and this is definitely one of them. With that said, one thing that the ACLU generally recommends sort of on a nationwide basis um, that the community component be approached in the way I'm about to suggest, um, which is that in creating an ordinance to authorize a CRB, 
the town council uh, look around the community and find uh, community organizations that represent various segments of the population. Um, that's a really good way to get at uh, various marginalized groups, as you mentioned, Councillor Bumgardner. So um, you could find community organizations that are active in the Black community, in the Latinx community, uh, LGBTQ, disability community, uh, where whatever you're trying to target. And you identify those community organizations as nominators. So the organizations then nominate somebody from the community and they have sort of the imprimatur of the, uh, the, the community organization behind them um, who's done some initial vetting. And then a final um, approval would be done by the town council. Um, so in addition to what Ms. Lanier said, I think that that is a, an often workable solution to figure out the community component to it. And then um, Ms. Hodge, I know that um, uh, you've been involved, uh, I believe, with the, the DEI committee, um, you know, as well as, a, as the faculty advisor for the Groton Youth Collective. And, um, you know, that is something that I would like to see incorporated in our, um, you know, our, in a, civ a civilian um, police review board mm -hmm. is having youth uh, involved, um, you know, uh, young people um, are on the front lines, you know, mm -hmm. in, in every respect of our community. And so you better believe, um, you know, there, there are many people who are interacting with our uh, law enforcement. And, um, you know, I, and so I, I think, again, their, um, you know, their representation matters. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, and I'll pass it off to you to answer the question. Well, no, I agree with you. Um, as a matter of fact, you're right. I am part of the DEI, the Town of Groton DEI Committee. Um, I'm on the Citizens Response Board, ironically. <laughs> so, um, and they, and during our last meeting, we did talk about just, just a bit because we were still structuring what our committee would look like and who would um, lead, facilitate the committee of someone from that committee um, either joining the police response committee or, or something to that nature. So we were still, you know, um, fleshing that part out. But you're right, I encourage the students that that was their focus. That's one of the reasons why they decided to organize and plan the protest is to develop that police relationship. And so um, I remind them that the police officers, the Groton police officers at least, have their ear, you know, their, their ears available to them. They speak with them. They are called on anytime. So I'm hoping that they take advantage of that. And um, so when I get off the, the Zoom call, I'm going to get on another with them and talk about that, as a matter of fact. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Nanaya uh, Ali, who was uh, um, to join us this evening, mm -hmm. I that she is uh, interning for exactly. the police department, the town exactly. police department. And yep. she serves as the student leader of uh, the Groton Youth Collective, which led the, um, the protest. So I think that is already a demonstration that there are you know, folks who, who want to, um, you, exactly. know, uh, you know, editorialize on the protests as a us versus them, exactly. um, you know, a scenario. I, I think it was truly anything but, you know, as you can see, uh, Ms. Ali has, um, you know, is learning the ropes of, of law enforcement locally. And I think that will, um, you know, most certainly inform uh, her activism in the future. Exactly. Uh, and actually, you know what, you just reminded me that she's actually going on the rides, I don't, I forget what she refers to them as, you know, she's, right along. yeah, ride alongs during the day and in the evening, she has different shifts. So that intern is coming to a uh, close next week, I believe she said, um, but she, Officer Bousquet has really, and Enfocerio has really taken her under their wing to, to um, expose her to, to the, the police department side of things. So no, it, it's absolutely important, you know, um, again, law enforcement have a role in pl to play in our community. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I encourage that. And I think whenever, you know, we see, um, you know, we see success stories, they, they should be uh, celebrated. Right, right. Um, and um, uh, with one more question slash statement, um, you know, I mentioned that uh, the Groton Youth Collective had uh, issued a series of demands in the aftermath of uh, George Floyd's murder. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And um, I would just like to, I, I won't read the, uh, the entire petition, um, mm-hmm. but I will read certain excerpts that especially apply to town government um, and, uh, to, you know, town policy. Um, so, you know, they ask, as the black community in Groton, um, we demand the police be held accountable and the blue wall of silence be taken down. Uh, we demand that uh, white supremacy be abolished in the town of Groton and the Groton Police Department completely. Um, we demand the Groton Police Department demilitarize immediately. Um, we demand that the Mayor Keith Hedrick of the City of Groton and uh, the Groton Town Council declare racism as a public health crisis in the town and the city of Groton. Uh, we demand that systemic racism be abolished in the Groton Police Department and in the Groton public school system. Um, we demand that there be any uh, immediate firing of any police officer who's racially biased, racist, and or supports raci- racist ideals in any way. Um, we demand that teachers, staff, and employers in the Groton public school system be held accountable if reported of treating a black student or staff member lesser than because of their skin color. Um, but we demand uh, that there is mandatory ongoing anti-racist, anti-police brutality and racial bias training set in place within the Groton Police Department. Uh, this training should incorporate realistic portrayals and scenarios given by the testimonials from black people. Uh, we demand 20% of the Groton Police Department budget be extracted and relo- relocated to the creation of mental health workshops in the Groton Public School System by the Black Mental Health Alliance to homeless shelters in the town of Groton and to other services that support black and brown residents. And uh, finally, we demand that the police and citizens together initiative oversee the blue wall of silence and the police union contract. Um, So I, you know, again, um, those were, um, you know, uh, all the Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Miss. That's okay. I just want to say that the the students and there's a group of them um, that are Fitch High School students and some students who have just graduated from Fitch High School, and some are alumni of Fitch High School. So they came up with these demands themselves. These no part of, uh, adults did not make any of these the, these decisions. They made no demands. Um, as a matter of fact, I, like, I remind you know people that now GYC, I refer to as, is an outside organization. I'm a teacher. I'm their BSU, Black Student Union advisor at the high school. That's a different entity. I can dictate what can and what cannot happen at Fitch High School. I cannot dictate what can and can happen outside of high school. So this is their organization and they're leading it. And if they have questions or concerns, they ask me, I advise them either way. If they, you know, they decide whether they can take my advice or not. But in school, at Fitch High School, as part of Black Student Union, that's a different story. And what I loved is they offered uh, concrete, actionable steps uh, the town of Groton can take to uh, end systemic racism, um, you know, in uh, all facets of, of town government and, and our public school system. Exactly, exactly. I commend our young people for that. I, I think exactly. that's absolutely amazing. Um, and so uh, can I just add one more yeah, thing? Yes. So on next Friday, this tonight we're meeting to work on the workshop for next Friday. And that's some of the things that they're going to be addressing with our teachers next Friday. That, that's fantastic. And, um, you know, I, I agree with, um, you know, um, ma- many of their demands, uh, if not all of them. Um, again, you know, it's incumbent on our body, you know, the, the Public Safety Committee and the Town Council and all, you know, as well as the RTM to, to shape, um, you know, again, how we will um, move forward with, you know, police accountability reforms and, you know, and um, you know, what a, um, identifying what a civilian police review board will look like. So um, I see that there are several other questions that um, um, uh, our TM members would like to ask. I just remind folks that it is 610. Um, and um, I know uh, Representative Thomas has been eagerly awaiting a, a series of questions. So with that, I'll pass it off to my uh, fellow uh, chair. Thank you, Councilor Baumgartner. Um, and thank you, um, our guests, uh, Ms. Moore, Ms. Hodge, and uh, Ms. Lanier. Um, it's been very informative and, and, um, and most of my questions have been answered. Uh, I had a lot of technical questions regarding the relationship to the town manager, the town council, the police chief, and the subpoena power. Um, 
So a lot of what you discussed earlier, as far as like a middle way to kind of work around creating effective oversight without having to get into a sort of a charter revision situation is very helpful. Um, I look forward to reviewing those notes. Um, a couple just little technical questions as far as if we went with a an advisory CRB um, and we chose not to try to assign it like a standing subpoena power. If we got into a situation, if, if the CRB was in a situation where they felt like they needed to issue a subpoena, they could could they apply to the town council to issue one on their behalf? Um, I, sorry, Go ahead. I'll answer real quick. Um, I would definitely advise like a, a legal opinion on that, but my reading is that yes, they could claim through the town council uh, in that subpoena power uh, based on the existing subpoena power granted to the town council. Okay. Um, when we were talking with the town attorney last night, she identified a couple uh, Connecticut statutes that she felt were kind of binding parameters for how subpoena powers work. And she mentioned 7-294BB uh, and EE, which had to do with the civilian complaint process. And, um, you know, I was at work all day today, so I didn't really have a chance to, to research those two particular things. Are you familiar with those statutes? Uh, yes, sir. And um, I think the concerns around those two statutes actually don't necessarily go to subpoena power, but investigatory power. Um, so what those two statutes do is uh, they are mandates from the General Assembly to um, post C to the Police Officer Standards and Training Council to create uniform policies about investigating complaints. And they are also mandates to law enforcement units to adopt policies about how they address complaints. Um, I've read through some of the concerns on that. And I think, I think that um, the town council would do really well to take those under advisement. Um, my, my read of the uniform policy uh, that was promulgated by post -C and adopted by the town of Groton Police Department is that it doesn't create exclusive authority to conduct investigations. It creates uh, what it identifies as primary authority mm -hmm. that I do not think revokes the ability to conduct concurrent investigations so long as the ability to conduct investigations also remains with the police department. Thank you for that. I would only say that if you envision ever needing to issue a subpoena or, or to go that road and it's not clearly articulated in your in your framing of your review board you're going to run into trouble so if you would like to at some point have the ability in the rare circumstances that you need it and it's not there i think it will be challenged um, and and i think the language would be key in terms of how you frame it in the likelihood that you ever need it mm -hmm. um, that you have access to it um, and, and that's only my opinion, I don't know. Um, but uh, I would agree with one, and I forget which one of the counselors who spoke about this, is if you're only hearing from one perspective, one attorney, and I don't know how many town attorneys you have, but maybe you can get, uh, seek a different opinion from another town counselor, uh, town attorney. Um, but I, I think if you are looking to do un something outside of what you have framed for this review board, you're gonna have challenges. And in the fact that in the likelihood that you may, if it ever goes to court, prevail, but um, if it's your expectation or your intent that you want that as an option of last resort, if you don't clearly articulate that, then I would try to do it. Understood. I appreciate that answer. And I, I, I take your point. Um, and one comment and I'll be done is, um, as we were discussing before, what, what do we envision this board uh, becoming? I am of the opinion it's better to have something and not need it than to need something and not have. It. There you go. I agree. So in that case, the speed of power would be a thing I'd like to see kind of firmly attached to, to the CPRB. 
And with that, I'll pass my, I'm done. Thank you. I, I agree with you, uh, Representative Thomas, and that, that was an uh, excellent question. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll pass it off to uh, Representative uh, Dean Sh uh, Shimbra. Hi, um, thank you. Um, a slightly off topic, I just wanted to address Ms. Lanier. I'm fascinated with your knowledge and uh, I, I, I've learned a lot listening to you and I want to applaud you. I have a son who several years ago had a problem with some officers in a neighboring town and we should have filed a complaint. And to be honest, I was scared and I didn't and neither did he. And I think modeling your behavior is the most important thing you can do for a young person. So I really give you a lot of credit because I know that's not, even in your position and with your knowledge, not easy to do. I wanted to ask what kind of training would be needed for the people on the board and how long you think that uh, a length of a uh, term should be for a board member. Wow, that's, that's an important question. Um, and not only the amount of training, the type of training, and um, one of the things uh, that the police are often complaining about, and I have to agree with them on this point, is there has to be an understanding of law enforcement, but not only law enforcement, but policing. And, and so if you have someone on the board without that foundation, then that is certainly where you wanna begin in them understanding policing, um, the police culture, um, the overall criminal justice system, but um, implicit bias. Um, I think that there is a, a, a subsection of our communities that aren't really aware that we all bring our biases to whatever we do. Uh, you know, it's, it's a culmination of our lived experiences and we all have biases. And so, but it's again, um, the training and understanding what implicit bias is and how it impacts people around you. Um, there's, uh, you know, and even the use of force, the understanding as to how things happen in policing. And when you go from a benign situation to a hands-on situation, um, the use of force continuum, there's, there's a lot to understand if you want to sit in judgment of someone and how they reacted to a situation. You have to have that foundation. Um, and also one thing that I regret that I don't know more about is the union's role, not only in policing, but in contracts and how in the world do they walk away with so much unchecked authority? And so how your unions function and why they function and what oversight we have. So, you know, uh, I would, I, I would say that that would probably be a conversation that you would want to sit down with your human resources person, your social workers in your community, your clergy in your community. And that's the other question I have. Do you have chaplains and does your chaplains reflect the town of Groton? How many chaplains do you have and who are they and are they uh, um, a reflection of your community, um, but they should be at the table um, um, because uh, you know uh, you we could sit and and try to create a, a checklist of things we need to cover, but if you don't have a diversity at the table, there's something that you might not consider that someone who doesn't look like you or think like you can add to the discussion where we all see the value. So. Um, yeah, that's a just, you know, in terms of what that should look like, I think that that's a community conversation or a conversation for a larger group so that we can ensure diversity and inclusiveness and um, yeah, but that's important. It's an important uh, um, uh, component of this review board is how you are going to engage in the ongoing training. And the other thing that when people hear training, they think cost expensive. There are, the ADL is a great resource for training. They come in and they do a very comprehensive program. Um, the NAACP, I'm sure you have stakeholders in your community um, that will come in and just have these discussions for free. So there is a way that you can bridge that training um, expectation without cost. And so those are things that you also need to think of to think about too. Thanks, and um, Ms. Lanier, you had 
Uh, go ahead, Ms. Boyd. Please go ahead. Um, I agree with that. I also would just like to plant the seed Ace. that the type. They are also. Um... <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I would like to plant the seed that the type of training needed also depends on the type of board that you have. Um, so if you have a board that's conducting its own investigations, um, it, in addition to the things uh, that Ms. Lanier mentioned, you would also probably want them to have training on proper investigation techniques, um, especially ones that respect due process requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so, but if you're having, if you have a board that only does review of completed investigations, that's not necessary. So there are some additional things that you can think of. I've seen models across the nation. I haven't seen it so much in Connecticut um, where it's explicitly um, considered that the police department itself it will come in and give education about the police functions. And that is a potentially good way to lay some of that cooperative groundwork as opposed to adversary. If um, start off on a training foot where uh, representatives of the police department get to come in uh, you know, on the clock and explain what, what their view is. Um, that's a way to get some folks up to speed on the operations of PDs too, and serve that second purpose as well. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moore, and uh, I will pass it off to uh, Representative Kassir. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, my question was actually going to go along right with this. Um, I actually am a former police officer. Um, I was a police officer in New London where they do the PCRC and part of the training for that is a citizens police academy um, which was what I was going to ask about your um, your opinions on whether or not that would be beneficial for members of our potential future CRB um, where the police department would come in and train them talk to them about case law and state statutes and police policy and procedures and so basically my question was just answered. So, but I just wanted to throw to, that in there that it's generally called a um, Citizens Police Academy and that's where they would train you in that stuff. Uh, thank you, Representative Cassier. Um, I know we very much appreciate your uh, unique insights, uh, you know, having um, uh, worn the badge. Um, and, and so I uh, appreciate that. And um, just, um, we uh, have Councilor Bordelon next. Councilor Bordelon. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Moore and Ms. Lanier, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, for coming because it's just really informative and I'd love to have you guys come back. I mean, we're just at the beginning stages of even thinking of this as a, you know, we just have the safety committee that just formed that we didn't have before. And now we've been tasked with forming something in this capacity. So. You know, this is great um, framework and uh, process. I was a former criminal justice major, major myself, so I have a little bit of knowledge about all this stuff. And, you know, it's really important to look at this, you know, from, a, uh, from the criminal justice aspect of juvenile justice as well. And I think, you know, hearing from the, um, Mrs. Hodge, um, one of the only maybe two or three minority teachers up at Fitch High School, um, it is important that we have minority representation. So when looking at this, we can say police powers and all these other things, but it's not, I want it to be understood that enacting a CRB is not racially driven in my, um, my motivation as a black or I am a bi multiracial female with male sons. Um, I was a criminal justice mayor, uh, major Ian is on here and he's worked for um, in the capacity in the Department of Corrections, um, you know, we we have an interest in it on the state side of like, it's not just a black or a white or a brown thing. There are people being mistreated and oversight happens in all colors. It's just motivated, it's charging right now in the community of the black community because they have been the most underserved, but let it be heard. I know many people that have been pulled over and just been sitting and texting and said they were suspicious by sitting there and then had to go through the gamut and said, what am I doing? I didn't, I did this, am I wrong to be sitting here? And so I just think it's important that I want everybody to know it's not, I think some people are caught up in Black Lives Matter movement and that's great. And, I'm, and, I, and I, I will say publicly that I support that, but politically I'm here to protect all the citizens of Groton. And I think it's important that we find 
the capacity and structure that's going to support all backgrounds. When people come to our, our um, come before us and say things like, I feel like the police sit in certain areas of the town of Groton and not in others. Why are they there? I don't feel safe over in this area. Why is it on this side of town? You don't see any police presence, but over here it's concentrated. We have to hear those concerns. So I just think it's really important that we look at the structure of the CRB being something that represents all of us in the community, not just male, female, gender equality, um, but also, you know, build the framework to build on to have the trust in um, the dialogue and the continuity to be able to, um, I want my kids to say, you know, that they feel safe when they be, where they're being pulled over. As a black female, I shouldn't have to teach my children how, um, when they're being pulled over, what that's going to look like, but I do. So how do we stop that? I would like the CRB to have that, um, kind of have it as an umbrella to help the minority community feel that there's an avenue, a chain of command. We talk about the dialogue that police use, the chain of command. What does that look like? The accountability. And as a, as a, as a taxpayer to the town of Groton, as a, a Fitch graduate, as a, as a longstanding community you know, member in this town, this is why I got involved. So I think it is important that people understand that the CRB is not just set up to go and say, we're gonna protect all the black people in the town and that's what we're doing it's important to make sure that it's something for everybody. And, um, and, and in that, looking at that structure to make sure that we're also encouraging minority recruiting. How long are we keeping positions open in our town before we fill them? Are we doing our due diligence on the minority recruiting aspect, especially in our police force? So uh, I'm excited to see where this conversation is gonna go. And I, I really would look forward to having you guys back to um, pull this all together. And I'm glad the RTM members joined us tonight. And um, I think there's a lot of work ahead. And, but my one question that I had to, wanted to ask that was left, from your experiences looking at um, the, N, the NAACP and the um, ACL represent people that are, uh, Ms. Moore and Ms. Linear that are represented here tonight. I hear so many people that get so upset by this. Law enforcement, I'm not gonna throw in political parties at all, but what, if, what, what are we afraid of? What are you, from your experiences and the things that you guys have seen go to court and prosecuted, what, are, what am I missing that everyone is so against? Once again, this is a, not a direct saying that anybody in our town has said that, but as a community, the people who have been rising up and the most vocal about not wanting this, what are the areas that I need to walk away with to understand and know so that I can better understand how they're feeling that maybe that you guys have seen from your community um, work because it seems very extensive and open and you probably have seen the cases go through. And so I'm curious as to what, 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 what are they concerned? I mean, I, I guess I read some articles where people have said, they're gonna take my kids, my house. I'm not gonna have any money. I'm not gonna have a place to live. They can go after all my assets. And I, I, I don't know, I just would, would love some clarification from you guys from your angle, if you're willing to give it. Thank you again. Well, well thank you. Um, and one of the things that I didn't share is I sit on the Racial Profiling Prohibition Project Board, um, and I've been in that position for, um, I think, since 2012. Um, and I've worked with lawmakers on the passage of a lot of reformative le legislation, and it was a big part of, uh, I was very involved in the passage of this bill. I worked um, um, very hard with a number of lawmakers, but what's so sad is the misinformation and the lack of understanding as to what's actually in the bill. And there's some things that I can tell you, I didn't learn until it was passed. I think that there were some changes in the, the 12th hour or, or, or um, in, in the midnight hour to the bill that were surprising to me, but the most debated, and I think the most distressing for many people is the qualified immunity. And um, I can tell you that um, while it's, 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 it's a bigger national problem, and I'm hoping that there will be some movement to address qualified immunity on the national level, but I can tell you there are so many injured or aggrieved parties that never got their day in court because of qualified immunity. Now, when people sue, it's not just because an officer had a bad day and made a mistake. It's usually because something egregious happened. 
um, there was a civil rights violation, there was some violation of law, there was something that wasn't respected. And so what I hear, um, and when I see trending on social media and 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 and, and, and in other circles, it's not just social media, is that this will open the floodgates for frivolous lawsuits. Mind you, um, it's not easy to get an attorney, firstly, to take a case to court. That is a challenge in itself. And I'm, I'm talking from personal experiences here. But what the qualified immunity says is if an officer is acting under the color of law, if he's doing or she is doing her job and something um, um, unforeseen happened and the, the scenario that I like to use is let's say you have a canine officer who's with a dog. And let's say he has the dog and he trips and falls and the dog runs off and he bites somebody. Um, and that person wants to sue that officer personally or sue the department. What happens is if an officer is acting in the color of law and something happens, qualified immunity protects them. And so um, what, what routinely plays out in court is officers are often blanketed in qualified immunity, irrespective of what the circumstances are. And I go back to use the circumstance with my daughter because we never got apology from the chief and from the, the first selectman. We did seek uh, legal redress and we did file a complaint in court. My daughter never got her day in court because of qualified immunity. My daughter was traumatized and uh, was also a criminal justice major planning to enjoy a career in law enforcement like myself and other members of my family and from a family of law enforcement people. And um, she actually has taken uh, an, an employment that has nothing to do with her career because of that experience. So she was ever changed, forever changed by that experience. But she could not seek legal redress because of qualified immunity. So when you have injured parties who have a right to seek redress but can't because of qualified immunity, there's something wrong with the process that never allows a person to have their day in court. And so those are the things that the law seeks to change. And the law does, it goes out of its way to say what the officer had to, has to be accused of is something egregious, a, 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 an egregious violation of law, a, a, an egregious dereliction of duty. And those cases are allowed to proceed. And then the, 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 the responsibility is placed on the court in terms of judgment and finding those cases. So, um, and somehow in, in terms of the explanation of what qualified immunity means, um, police have interpreted that who I, I would argue should know better um, that this means that they're going to be the victim of a lot of complaints and uh, uh, civil lawsuits, and they're going to lose their homes, but that's only if they acted in a manner that is outside the color of law, and that it's an egregious act where they violated someone in a way that um, um, qualified immunity does not protect them. So that's what I hear mostly in terms of what the outrage is, what the protests are about, um, that police are going to quit their jobs. Now, mind you, um, and, and like I said, I've worked in law enforcement. And the reason why I encourage my daughter, it's a great career. Um, law enforcement officers, people who don't have to have a degree can walk away earning $100,000 a year. It's a great career. It's a fulfilling career. And, and so for people to say, well, because you've now removed some measure of qualified immunity, I'm gonna walk away from my job. And I just have to ask this, well, where are you gonna to go to make that kind of money? Um, and, 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 and again, when you're in law enforcement, you're usually in it because you love what you're doing. So you're gonna turn your back on, 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 on the fact that you love helping people, you love working with people, you have no real exposure and you're gonna walk away from a, a great career because of a legislation that says, we're gonna hold bad actors accountable. 
it just doesn't make sense to me, but it's a lot of misinformation. And, and I think people are acting on emotion and not taking the time to read the bill <laughs> or read the law at this point. Thank you, thank you, Councilor Bordelon, and uh, rest assured, uh, um, Ms. Lanier, we uh, will be reading uh, whatever uh, ultimately comes out of this body. Um, you know, we will certainly read that ordinance uh, several times over. Um, you know, uh, to... may, I, may I comment before we move yes. on to the next question? Yes. Um, because I think Councilor Bordelon made a lot of good points, and they, they raised something for me. So the first part of your comments raised something for me that I think is really um, interesting and important to think about, which is that um, a lot of these conversations are contextualized around police misconduct, right? And we have to hold police accountable when they do something wrong. But uh, I would encourage you to think about it in an additional way as well, which is that we want to make sure that police are serving in the way that they are supposed to. So um, one of the one power that could be um, given to a CRB is to make sort of a big picture investigation, right? Look at trends and patterns. And those don't necessarily have to be about misconduct, right? Or how the department is responding to misconduct. It could be about, in this part of our community, uh, responses to 911 calls take twice as long as in another part of our community. And how do we address that discrepancy? In this part of our community, crimes with victims um, are investigated more often than in this part of our community. So though those are less about uh, individual cases of uh, officer misconduct, which does occur, and more about how we make sure that the police department in our community is serving everybody who lives in that community. So I would encourage you to include that as part of your thinking about what a CRB can do. Um, and as far as what opponents are concerned about, um, I spent many, 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 many hours in July working on trying to correct some of the misconceptions out there about qualified immunity. Um, I will say that the ACLU fought very, very hard for a stronger version of qualified immunity. So that should tell you some of the things that you want to know about how far exactly this goes. It did not go nearly far enough in our opinion. Um, because uh, as Ms. Lanier said, um, Officers are protected personally up and until the point that they commit willful misconduct in that they are trying to violate people's rights. Up until that point, they are indemnified. They were already indemnified, but the new bill makes it very clear that they're indemnified um, by, by the municipalities that employ them for conduct up until that point. Um, and the standard for when qualified immunity will let a case go forward is, um, better than what we had. It's not as robust as it could or maybe even should be. Um, but if an officer acted in objective good faith that they were acting under the law, they still have the defense of qualified immunity. Um, it's really not sort of the hysterical um, portrayal that we've seen out there. And I think that um, there's a lot of room to have education on that. I think the other thing that people are concerned about around the bill and sort of um, generally are about uses of force. I've seen a lot of concern that officers are, um, they're going to be put in dangerous situations where they will be afraid to act in their own protection because um, the contention is that increasing the standard for when a use of force is impermissible will make a whole bunch of things that they're allowed to do right now impermissible. And so I think that is the other major area of concern. I, I disagree with that. I think that there are a lot of ways that an officer can use force in their uh, defense of themselves, defense of somebody else um, under the existing, uh, under the new use of force standard, but that is an area of concern. And finally, I think more generally and probably more towards your consideration since um, since creating a CRB won't impact on uh, qualified immunity or the use of force standard as much, is that um, there seems to be sort of a resistance to the idea of interference in their ability, in police officers' ability to do their job, right? They don't want to be micromanaged. They do not want to be told how to behave when they go out and do a job in the community that can sometimes be dangerous. So I think 
there's a perception that if we do too many regulations, it's going to impact people's ability to be safe when they do their job of policing. Uh, th thank you, Ms. Moore. Um, now, um, I uh, don't believe there are any other questions. I'd just like to remind uh, uh, our team members and fellow counselors, we have eclipsed the 90 um, minute mark. And I, I know we've, um, we've had, uh, we have invited guests to grace us with our presence. So I, I do wanna be respectful of their time. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, again, just like to thank everyone for participating tonight. I um, so very appreciate uh, the RTM's willingness to participate in our discussions. Um, you know, it, you know, it, um, you know, as you know, uh, whatever ultimately does come out of the town council uh, does have to be um, not passed by the RTM, but um, not vetoed uh, by the RTM. If I if I have that correct, so. Um, but uh, you know, again, thank you so much, uh, Representative Thomas, for your leadership uh, on this issue, and um, you know, um, uh, committee members from uh, both parties represented. You know, the beauty of the RTM is that it is a um, bipartisan body. Um, you know, uh, representative of uh, a really cross section of, of our of our community, and I think that those insights, uh, that perspective, is, is so valuable, especially when we're deliberating on uh, an issue that. Um, um, is, uh, will ultimately, I think, be followed by so many in our community and uh, have been, um, you know, over the past few months. So, um, uh, you know, as an aside, um, just, you know, we more generally also discussed um, policing policy reforms. I, um, that was an agenda item. So, um, you know, uh, we'll kind of skip through that since we have already kind of asked those questions, but just kind of on that one topic, um, you know, one, one thing I would like to see come out of this process is that there is more uh, data and uh, transparency, um, you know, uh, coming from the police department. That way the public can um, read data, um, accurate data, up-to-date data uh, that is accessible where they don't need to necessarily FOI uh, that information either. Um, you know, that, that should, you know, I, I come from the belief that should um, pertain to all parts of the government, every line item, all that should be posted online for public consumption. Um, that's so important, I think, to taxpayers, you know, that they can um, rationalize and see if they're getting a good bang for their buck, you know, uh, return on their, uh, you know, uh, their, uh, you know, ta taxes. So, um, you know, with that, I I'd like to see um, the police department start organizing uh, data that they can kind of update on and dashboard that can be accessible, uh, you know, on our website. I think that would be welcomed, uh, especially by our council and the RTM, but also ultimately a, uh, a CPRB. So um, with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn unless uh, Representative Thomas has any other closing remarks, as is, this is a joint, uh, joint committee meeting. I just want to thank you again for the invite and for making this happen. And I want to thank our guests for, for gracing us with their time. And um, if nothing further, I'm, I'm good. Councillor Bumgardner, I just wanted to thank you for doing the field work and bringing in these two highly qualified, uh, you know, uh, Oh, women you. of of power and and knowledge and diversity and background and leadership to come in and and uh, be here. So thank you for your groundwork in that, uh, Councillor Bumgarner. Well, I, their their work and uh, you know certainly the my esteemed committee fellow committee members uh, make my life a lot easier. You know it's been a pro privilege working with each of you uh, in this Zoom as, as well as our friends on the RTM, and I, I welcome the opportunity to do so the again in in the case. You know, we have folks um, coming from the outside coming in. Um, I, again, I think that, that um, uh, under, understanding what each committee is doing is so important that we, you know, again, work in unison uh, and uh, work to the same rhythm and beat. So um, with that, I will entertain a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Yeah. Second. And I say thank you for having me. And at some right. point, I look forward to meeting you in the future. I retract my second so she can speak. Sorry. I'm going to say any any last words or comments. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I appreciate the invitation. And uh, I also, uh, Councillor Baumgartner has my email address. I uh, would welcome questions if you guys have them. Please feel free to reach out. 
would it be appropriate to ask you guys to share your contact information in the chat so we can save it um, if we wanted to send like questions or anything or your best way to contact you guys if you're willing to? Yes, I can Absolutely. do that. Thank you. Absolutely, and I'd be happy to share uh, their contact information with committee right. committee members as well. So, perfect. Uh, so I believe um, with that I will call. Uh, I will adjourn this meeting, and um, I wish each and every one of you a, a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you again. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.